Hello and welcome to Tokyo Inklings. My name is CY and you can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com, on Instagram and TikTok at tokyostationpens, and on Twitter at tokyostationmnh. And my name is Jacob. I'm a Fudo fan on Instagram and on Twitter and have a blog at fudofan.com. And this is episode 59. And you know what, Jacob? I've been thinking and I just realized I don't think we actually told the listeners that now we have an Instagram account uh, that we post about these um, these episodes before we release them. So that's at Tokyo Inklings on Instagram. Yeah, and I think in our show notes, I, I, I never put links to any of our Instagram accounts. Maybe I should start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we do now have a um, an Instagram account for specifically... Uh, the podcast and um, some of the listeners have actually asked me specifically for this so I thought it'd be a good um, thing to announce but yeah we've we've done this for the past 15 16 ish episodes Um, you know we post uh, I kind of like a picture that's semi related to to what we're going to talk about so if you you know got the time give it a listen give it a check and uh, and yeah um, help spread the word and that's uh, I mean if if you have some feedback and you don't want to go to the website and put a comment there, you could also go to Instagram and comment. So. That's right. That's right. That's uh, that's super helpful. And um, and yeah. So, without further ado, we've got a we've got a um, surprisingly super super busy episode today because we've you know we've been kind of light on the news for the past few weeks, and it seems like everything just wants to collapse. Um, into itself together, right? Yeah, yeah. It went so, f- it went from nothing to suddenly a bunch of releases. Yeah. Um. So let's start off with uh the Naniwa Pen Show. Osaka, being the second largest city in Japan, has actually never had its own pen show. It's always been either Tokyo or Kobe. Um, Tono Limbs with Giftionary Delta decided to open this new show. Uh, this year called the Naniwa Pen Shows. For those of you who don't know, Naniwa is a, kind of like an old name for for Osaka. And, you know, I thought it being the first edition of the show, um, I thought it'd be interesting to go. So um, Alessa of Inky Rocks and I went down to Osaka for a day to check out this show. Now, um, I should have known because this is an event run by Tono Limbs that the the organization to enter the show would be an absolute disaster. I should have known this. But, you know, naive little me, the show opens at 11 o'clock. We get there at 11 and they say, okay, you need to take this, uh, the, the, um, I don't know how to say this in English, but the this like waiting number. And so Alyssa and I, we get number like five hundred. So that was was that random, or was it depending on what time you came? Apparently, you can start getting numbers at ten o'clock in the morning, so one hour before show open, and that's random. And then afterwards, it's kind of in order, right? Okay. So so we get there, we get the number five hundred. Or 550. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 you got the number 500. That's great. Thank you very much. We've just let number 200 in. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So and, that was very similar to my experience. Remember that Tony Limbs event I, I went to? Yeah. So I, I got the number 400 something, and it was all of that 200. But the, uh, they tried to estimate. I'm sure it was the same thing. They tried to estimate, and the estimate was completely off. Yeah. And the moment that they gave us the number, I looked at it and I said, hey, let's go get a coffee. Let's let's do something else. Maybe we'll f- go to another pen shop first mm. um, before we go. So we actually ended up going up to uh, Umeda in, um, and uh, we, we, got, we went to the Nagasawa shop in Umeda. And that was actually quite fun. We, we we got to meet one of the 
I think he must have been like one of the managers. We got to meet the 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 store manager, and uh, unfortunately, I purchased a the red ebonite uh, Naginata King of Pen, the Koen, and I found this Kinkakuden paper. Mm. Jacob, have you ever played with this Kinkakuden paper before? Yeah, so when I went to, I think it was Kamihaku back in in yeah. March, uh, I think they said that Kinkakuden was either discontinued or for some reason they didn't have it so that other washi paper called like Kamifubuki, the one I, I gave you, that was meant to be sort of the, uh, the successor to that. That's how they explained it to me. That's really interesting because I... I have the Kamifubuki and, and the Kinkakuten mm. now. I, the Kinkakuten was discontinued, I believe, in 2018. And I, I, I first became aware of this paper by looking at Leigh Reyes' um, Instagram post. She loves this Kinkakuten paper to do art with. Mm. And you know, it takes, takes ink pretty well. I found that Kinkakuten actually has less feedback than, um, than Kamifubuki. And obviously, it doesn't have the little colored like squares, mm. right? But um, yeah, it was surprisingly very nice. But I think that's an interesting point because what you mean by act, act handling ink well takes ink well. I think it depends on, on on what your intention is. I mean, if you want to do like ink swatches, then I, I think it's hard to argue no. that, that this will be yeah. better. But if you are an artist and you actually want the idea, you know, a little bit of feathering. It can be actually an effect that you want, right? And, and then, then this can be a good paper. Yeah, and you, you just mentioned this feathering concept on these really extremely textured papers. It's almost like um, the fibers almost look so short that there's a little bit of that parchment feeling, mm. right? It's it's not feathering in the nasty way in the sense that like oh the words get like fuzzy and and you know you can't really read it mm. anymore especially when you do like e's or like a's where you have those little loops mm. it's more like a it's like more um, a tasteful kind of slow fade um, that makes it look kind of old I think mm. that's the the kind of like little feathering that you get um, which can actually be a really nice effect yeah. yeah. So I went there, um, ended up buying more stuff at, uh, at this um, uh, Nagasawa Umeda than the actual pen show itself. Is but that because they had more stuff that you want or because the pen show had such long lines that it was just too much effort to, to buy stuff? Yeah, so, so we actually ended up eating lunch and then going back. So it took us three hours to get in. <laughs> okay. Um, and by then, most of the, you know, the very coveted stuff, like the, the glass pens, right? Yeah. They're all gone. Um, but I did actually buy some stuff at the show itself. And it's very interesting because if this were, let's say, Tokyo Pen Show, or especially a Western Pen Show, I think, um, the items that we bought would definitely been just gone for sure. Mm. So, um, the two items that I, I purchased, uh, or, or the, the two kind of genres that I purchased was, first was a, um, a sailor release, actually two sailor releases by this uh, company called Tayama. So, they make uh, color travel, mm. right? And they, they actually do pretty interesting stuff. But I managed to purchase... Um, two of these sailor pens. So they, they look like the uh, Profit model, 1911, um, but they're like extra long. And they had in, in the middle of the body, right, is a section, it's not the section, but there's, there's like a part. There, there's a, um, there's a, most of the body is actually made of deer horn. Ah, and, oh, yeah, you, you sent me the photos. It, yeah, it looked look, look like an aftermarket thing. Yeah. And these deer horn pens always do very, very well with collectors. And they had them 
at some kind of a crazy price. So so I bought both the maroon and the ivory. Um the ivory color, not ivory. For yourself, of um, course. For your personal collection. We'll see. <laughs> um but what's interesting I thought was that first of all they they've made like less than like twenty of each color. And um these pens are actually uh created from these horns from the the deer that are around uh Hiroshima mm. the you know the the floating the floating tori gate uh in i think Miyajima yes they actually take the the horns from the deer so that the deer won't um attack and harm people and with every portion of the sales they actually send money to conservation efforts out in Hiroshima to you know make sure that these deer don't go extinct basically I thought that was a pretty cool story I've been to Miyajima I think three times and uh, the, wow. the deer are always very they want to eat like if you if you have like senbei cookies that they are they become your best friends yeah and so yeah just to stop people from getting hurt mm. you know every year they it's like it's like dogs and their you know nails right mm. like you got to walk the dog um so that was pretty cool uh and i think i got uh i got horns with pretty good patterns and then the second one is this wagner pen hidari uma mm? which one is that it's a uh, hidari uma so um i didn't link it to you right now but it's uh it's this one right here it's this it's actually a pilot ah i think our friend uh, sofia has one of those exactly yeah. so at a at another pen show these pens would have been snapped up instantly mm. right but because this show is much more focused on like um i would say you know glass pens the culture that mm. that tono limbs have built uh, th- these were s- shockingly still around four hours after show open. <laughs> but that was exactly so, the same buttons. thing at at these Tony Limbs events that I went to, right? So you had like Hachimonja there with like Ginza and Snow and like the, 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 the white and white and pink capless, and you know you had a Kobayashi there with the, the Ichigo Sailor Mini, and and no one bought them. They all went for the inks and the glass pens. Yeah. Which I think it's just a different culture yeah. of um of of purchasing, but yeah, I th- I thought that was uh pretty nice for me that I could get this. And Nagahara had like um open times, so Alessa just walked up to me like, hey, here's a pen, here's a pen that I'd like you to work on. <laughs> and I think this time might be the first time that he's officially brought his apprentice mm. um to the show. Yeah, he's been tweeting about that. Can we talk that. about his apprentice? Uh, yeah, he's been tweeting yeah. about it, but I don't think we have talked about it on the show. No. So his apprentice is actually his son, Nagahara the Third, and I actually felt kind of bad, and I don't, I wouldn't expect anything else, but basically, um, his son was really just there as an assistant. So he, his son didn't do any grinding um and was basically there to take names and to manage the the line which i felt kind of bad because i i almost wish that there was an option for us to try what the sun is doing you know just because we we've, we've, we've had Nagahara so many times, right? I'm just very curious, like what the son can do. Yeah, but maybe he's so, not at at the point yet where he's willing to, you know, do this f- for money, right? Maybe he's still training. Yeah, perhaps. I did ask um Shosaikan, and apparently the son is actually pretty good. So, so we'll see. I, I I have um I'm I'm very excited to see what um what. Nagahara III brings to the table, uh, so to say. And it's but, also going to be very interesting to see what he chooses, what grinds he's willing to do and not to do, because we have talked about how yep. Nagahara the second he refuses to do anything flex-related and he refuses to do stack nibs. Yeah. 
Um, although I've never heard of the third, and I don't think the third worked at Sailor, so I'm also I'm also curious: is the son doing it to you know please his father, or is he doing it to you know because he actually loves doing it? So we'll see. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, that was pretty much the pen show. Um, I met up with Izumi afterwards. We had dinner. You know, we we chatted about kind of behind the scenes stuff. Um, but overall, I think it was very successful. Um, I'm actually very happy with the show. Uh, depending on where it is, I might want to go again next year. But I think there's definitely a difference between like kan kansai shows and kanto shows. You know how kansai people are almost like a little bit more friendly. I did feel that as well at the show. So, yeah. The the venue seemed very nice. I only saw photos. It seemed like some old, elegant oh, building. Oh yeah, so the venue was was awesome. The venue was this um kind of old um government building mm. from like 150 years ago. The problem is that it was too dark, so you couldn't really see the products very well. Mm. So yeah, it it did look really really cool, um, and the inside was very very nice, but it was a little dark. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So would you ever go down to like a Naniwa Pen Show or a Kobe Pen Show? Uh, I, it's possible, but I have, I don't think I've been to Osaka like fifteen years now. So yeah, maybe I. <laughs> Overdue. When I travel, it tends to be up north, but we'll see. It could happen. <laughs> yeah. Now that's the that's the Naniwa Pencho. It was it was pretty nice, and it kind of I haven't been to Pencho since Tips, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, it kind of oh, yeah, because brought me back into the mood. You weren't at the Tony Limbs event. I can't remember why. Maybe you were traveling or quarantine or yeah. something like that. Yeah, maybe I was I was doing something else, but. Yeah, it was it was mm. good, and um, yeah, now I'm ready to go out to the USA. Right, and uh, if you can afford the the, the flight ticket, <laughs> <laughs> which is getting. I mean, we we talked very recently about how it's how it's was going up. I think it's it's even worse since the last time we talked about it because of the fuel prices and because of the ever weakening yen especially if, you, if you're if you yeah. paying in yen and, and I mean that ties into topics later in the show but yes get expensive I mean I, I bought the tickets I think late I want to say February like just before the war in Ukraine and I thought it was really expensive back then now with the weakening of the yen it's going to be terrible yeah but yeah um Anyways, on to some new releases. We haven't had these in quite a while, Jacob. Uh, and you you actually kind of teased this like a few episodes back. Yeah, it was back in, in March, I think, uh, after we went to uh, Wagner's spring event. So we talked about there's going to be a new Platinum 3776 nib. So not just a new like nib grind not just a new stamp but that the actual shape of the nib is going to change and that has now been announced i think it was just a few days ago uh, platinum announced this 10th anniversary 3776 century called decade they're really announcing two things at the same time here they're announcing this anniversary pen which is this gathered th flat top 3776 which is going to have a new nib, but also, I mean, at least I think for us, the more interesting part of the announcement is the fact that they are they are now, um, they have changed the nib design and and, uh, and what is implied <coughs> here is that three seven seven six models from now on are going to have the new nib. And what is different about the new nib is that it's supposed to be slightly, um softer has a little bit more bounce so somewhere between the regular 3776 like hard nibs and the soft nibs yeah um do you like this release uh if you talk about the pen i think it's an interesting choice because this is this is 
I think this is appealing to let's call it like a Wagner audience, right? It it's it's sort of an almost like a throwback vintagey, you know, gathered design, right? I, I definitely think there are platinum collectors who are like this. And um, I think it might be people who have similar pens in their collection and probably not necessarily the same kind of people who are like, you know, the Kinshu and the Rocca. But what about you specifically, though? Like, because you're you're an Oyaji, right? You, you've <laughs> cemented yourself as a black pen gold. Yeah, but I'm a, I'm a cheapskate Oyaji, so I don't buy new pens, right? Uh, <laughs> but I so personally, I'm not particularly interested in the pen. I am very interested in the nib, so I, I do want to try the new nib as soon as possible. I'm curious about the reasoning. I mean, why why are they like? What prompted them to redesign the nib? Is this, I mean, does this use less gold, or is it has, has is this because of customer feedback that it's too stiff, or what? Actually, what do you think is the would be the reason why they would redesign the nib like this? So, if you look at the shoulder, mm. it actually looks like it marginally uses less mm. gold. So, knowing platinum, that actually might be the reason why. Yeah, which I think is a good good reason, right? I mean, if if they can make something that isn't worse than they have now and they have less gold, then why not? I like, by the way, and yeah. this is probably, I mean, obviously this is not a sign of what the nibs are going to look like, but the anniversary pens stamp looks pretty nice. I'm wondering now what a new regular... 3776 stamp is going to look like going forward. So I think this has several implications, you know, obviously, as you said, for the stamp. But what about for Nakaya? Is Nakaya going to change their nibs as well? That's a question. It would be very surprising if they didn't, because now they need to maintain two production lines, right? The other thing I'm wondering is, we have been talking a few times in the past about how the music nib has a different feed and than the other Platinum 3776 nibs. I'm wondering, I can't really tell from the photos, but I'm wondering if there's a new feed, and in that case, if it's going to be one feed for all the nibs. Yeah, that's what I was curious about too, whether these are going to be interchangeable mm. on the pen bodies. And I'm looking at the press release, and they have these three different you know, nibs to show the three different versions mm. of the, the platinum nibs. But several things that I noticed. First of all, these are not the only variation of nibs in the platinum history. There's actually been several different changes um, in between, including, as you said, the, the feed uh, shape mm. also that the nib shape um, has been slightly different uh, so there I, I can think of at least two more variations in this so it's very interesting they didn't put that up second of all they call it the decade mm. saying it's the 10th anniversary of I guess the century right yeah but it's the 11th year so <laughs> Well, I don't know exactly when it was announced, if there's a difference between, you know, announced in December and shipping in January. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 that one. I didn't actually notice that, but that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, because they say from 2011, they started selling the century, and then 2022, they're going to sell the decade. Yeah. The other thing here, interesting thing about the announcement is the ink which, based on the photo, looks like a sheen monster ink, which is not something we've ever seen from Platinum before. Yeah. I want to um, actually draw attention to the kind of commentary by a pen or, or Platinum enthusiast. Uh, I don't know if you know her, but um, it's uh, th their name is A.K., A.K. Faulkner, she's, they've bought several um, several pens from me before. And I'll, I'll send you the link on Instagram. So they say, I'm begging Platinum Pen 
to stop thinking like 90-year-old men with these mediocre releases. There are only so many black pens we need, folks. You could be showering us with a sailor-style constellation of color choices at a fraction of sailor prices. But hold up. Wait. No. Platinum have got another boring beep black pen for us. I don't care that it's a new nib. I don't care that it's got a short gathered section. I care that they've become so completely out of touch with what the modern market wants to buy. If you want like sailor style colorful pen, you do have that both with Platinum's own, you know, the Fuji releases and various store exclusives. They do have that. I don't think there's a good reason to, to expect Platinum to be significantly cheaper than Sailor. That has may, maybe been a coincidence. I don't think there's a I don't think that is a reasonable expectation going forward. But also with this pen, given that it is an anniversary pen, and given that Platinum has a history of, you know, gathered pens and so on, I th- I think as a throwback release, this makes sense. And and this doesn't mean that you know the next decade of three seven seven six pens are going to be boring black pens. It's just that they are celebrating their anniversary with, with a pen that looks like some earlier pens. So I guess the the question is: Do you think anniversary pens should be more like traditional conservative, or do you think they should kind of push the boundaries? Because we see different approaches, right? Like Pilot has very you know colorful Urushi pens. But everybody was disappointed in their 100th anniversary, right? Even though they did actually put out some interesting ones, just that the interesting ones were not for sale. I think you can make the argument that Platinum, Sailor, and Pilot, they all have somewhat conservative anniversary pens. Yeah. Right? If you want colorful pens, then skip the anniversary pens. You go for their store exclusives, go for their regular models. I, I don't think... The anniversary pens need to be, you know, mm. something forward-looking. It can be something that celebrates what they have, but I mean, their history. Yeah, that that's fair. Um, that's very fair indeed. Yeah, this uh, this decked pen. I'm looking forward to to seeing it. I'm looking forward to trying it. And uh, and there will be three thousand seven hundred and seventy-six pieces. So I expect these to be in store for quite a while. Yeah, me too. I I don't think in general uh, Platinum's releases, they don't, with some exceptions, Compu being the most obvious one, they don't seem to sell that fast. Yeah. Maybe it has to do with how they calibrate the the man. I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, Yeah. I, I think both of us probably agree that What's interesting here is, is not the anniversary pen. What's interesting is the nib, and we would love to try the new nib, and, and it would be interesting to see what other pens will have this new nib. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's uh, go to the next ones. So we have a new capless from Usagi. I actually learned about this from, from Izumi a few days mm. ago. Well, this one is it's interesting a- for, a, for a few reasons. So first of all, well, at least to me, the biggest thing is the price. You remember back about one year ago, we talked about Usagi's, um, they had Oborotki or something, something like that. They had this, yeah. it looked a little bit like a uh, capitalist wish, but it was one with both uh, chrome trims and with matte black trims. And that pen, if memory serves me right, was somewhere around 26,000 yen. Now, one mm. year later, they have another capless limited edition and they have bumped the price with 10,000 yen, 36,000 yen. And I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think, uh, naively, I, I would say this doesn't look like a more elaborate design. I don't think why this would necessarily be more costly. I think this is just, as with everything else we talked about or you know, another topic later in the show, this is just a sign of how prices are changing because of the, the, the weakening yen because of the gold prices and I think we're going to see more capitalist pens more pilot pens this year that's going to have prices like this yeah I absolutely agree 
but I think this price actually puts it um, quite in line with the capitalist SE pricing. I think the SE is um, 33,000 yen, right? So I think while it did get a bit more expensive, I don't think it's an outrageously expensive price. Again, we'll talk about outrageously expensive pens later. Um, I, I think, yeah, this should still be very popular, should sell out almost immediately even at this new price. That would be interesting to see. I mean, the last year's one definitely sold out very fast and people went to great yep. lengths to, to acquire them. I mean, it's, it's always hard, or it's usually hard to acquire pens from Osagia for various reasons. Another thing about this pen, do you remember, I think it was last year, Itoya had, I think they have an, had an exclusive capitalist called like Ginza Modern Classic. That was basically a grayscale yes. version of this pen, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was like a, it was like a white and gray version of this pen. And that one was, I think, significantly cheaper. I think it was less than thirty thousand yen. So yeah, prices are definitely going up. Yep, uh, I I agree, and um, I think I think it, it's it's a good and a bad thing. I mean, we haven't had inflation in Japan in twenty years, so <laughs> yeah. Um, the the only thing is are they going to pay their employees more because of this <laughs> yeah what will <laughs> that's yeah. that's a big question yeah uh yoseka pen um they yoseka stationery is a is a shop that uh i think i can speak for the both of us we love mm. this shop um not just because of its aesthetic but you know what it's trying to do i think in the us it's it's very different it's almost like i mean they're they're from taiwan but it's almost like a japanese pen shop yeah in the us right and they've come up with this new pen called the yoseka sen refresh what do you think of this pen it reminds me a bit about hachimonia pens it reminds me a bit about the shikiori pens and especially I mean, with, with Hachimondria, this, this is sort of this translucency going on. It almost looks like Urush in the sense that you have this like a transparent layer on top, right? Which I think, mm. I think is very, very tasteful. And, and you know, the, um, the, the translucent uh, pinkish finial. Yeah, I think, yep. think the color combination is great. Uh, the only thing, and I always, I always say that about the US release, I always wish the... Uh, the nib would have a custom stamp, but that seems to be, never be the case with any US releases for reasons I don't fully understand. Which I think brings me to something really interesting. Um, and I actually talked to Daisy and Neil from Yosaka Pens about this, but I think their first pen, which was the Origins, the green shimmering mm. one, that might be one of the first pens in the US, like a US exclusive, mm. to really have these large glitter particles mm. and um, and in pro gear, because most of them were in this 1911 shape, right? And I was talking to them and said, hey, you really actually showed Sailor mm. that the 1911 works. And they said, yeah, and I think you know we convinced them that glitter works too. And so it's really cool that they're they're coming out with the second pen. Notice that the finial design is actually different from their first pen. Um, it's the second letter mm. of their logo. That's very nice. I like and that. I think, yeah, I think what they're doing is really, really nice. And maybe the third release, because this is going to be a set of three, the mm. third release, maybe they'll finally convince Sailor to let them do custom nib engravings. Yeah, I really wonder why... Why they don't generally do that for like US pens? Because almost all store exclusives in Japan have custom nibs. Like whether it's like Bombbox or Hachimondia, Pentanote, Penhouse, Kingdom Note, they all have custom, like, usually laser engraved, but, but uh, custom nib designs. I wonder if it's because Sailor said no, or if it's because Itoya of America is a little bit shy when coming when when asking sailor mm, about this so i i wonder what is the the story here but yeah i think if these pens had a custom even laser engraved design mm. it would look really really nice it would really complete the look yeah especially with that with that you'll take a character right that that would, that would be perfect yeah we'll have hope for that in the last release 
Yeah, so let's hope that Daisy and Neil are are listening to us, and if not, <laughs> I will let them know in approximately eight, nine weeks. Sure. Um, one thing about this, I know we're getting a bit long here, but one thing about this is that uh, the price, it was like $440, I think. And I've been hearing people talk about how expensive this pen is at $440, and the Slim is, I think... Uh, I think three hundred and um and twelve dollars. Mm. They're like, oh my god, these pens are so expensive. But looking at the pen themselves, I don't actually find them that costly, even compared to the Japan, um, the Japan prices, right? Well, four hundred forty—that's almost sixty thousand yen nowadays, right? And but nowadays, yeah. Yeah, it's it definitely on the on the on the expensive side, but uh, I'm sure it's more expensive to. I mean, to do an exclusive in the US than in Japan. One thing that people don't notice though is that when, because I feel like the argument is always, oh, Sailor, um, you know, you could buy a slim size for $100 like two years ago or three years ago, Mm. whatever it is. But then a lot of people don't realize that when you could do that, Sailor was losing money, right, for for many, many years. Mm. So they've only really started, you know, making money again after these price increases. Yeah, many things have changed. I mean, you, you, I mean, you, you, you can make that argument about almost anything, right? Everything was was, <laughs> was cheaper years ago. Yeah. So you can't expect prices to never change. Yeah. So I, I don't think that that's necessarily a fair agreement. Mm. But we caught wind of new sailor price increases. Um to go into effect in August. Mm. I've shared with you the price list. We won't we won't link this in the show notes. Um but I shared with you the price list. What do you think about because because this is basically they they, they shared a, a list that said okay um everything on this list we're gonna have new prices and then everything not on this list is gonna stay the same. Right? But this price change is 16 pages yeah it's not i mean we talked so much about gold prices but this is this is steel nibbed pens this is ink this is everything yeah it's it's really really like i mean across the board it's like a 10 to 20 percent price increase and that's pretty hefty considering that nowadays the the you know the full size model they're like three thirty forty thousand yen now, and then it's gonna jump again, and I feel like they haven't it's not been that long since their last price increase mm. the the one that is that hurts the most but is also the most interesting are the special nibs series, so the Naginata series. Yeah, I, I I saw that. Yeah, I saw it. But they have. I mean, I think when they when the bespoke line was originally released, you know, first sellers stopped selling Naginata Togis and and uh, other yep. bespoke names for like two years, and then they came back with this yep. new bespoke line. And at the time, we thought the prices were insane, right? Because just two years earlier, because they were double. Yeah, I mean, and this goes back to our, our discussions just before, right? I could go to to Marzen and buy a Naginata Togi like the retail price for like twenty five thousand yen just just two years yep. before. So we thought the prices were insane, but they have remained they have unchanged for a while. Meanwhile, the other sale releases have gone up in price. So it's almost like a yep. correction to make the bespoke line more in line with other sailor prices. And the old prices or the current prices are 55,000 yen and the new prices are going to be 77,000. Mm. So that's that's like a 30% increase. I feel like that hurts a lot. They probably did not have a choice, but I think this will force sailor to think more about what they can do do at the lower end. I mean, we know from the past they have mentioned in their annual report that they want to see what they can do more with you know low end pens steel nibs and so on i think they're going to be forced to look at that because whether or not you think 70,000 yen is good value it's, it's going to be i mean in absolute terms just too much for a lot of people right so if you want 
Mm. Like, you, that you need something else in the lineup that is actually you know within reach for people. And I think that's what separates Sailor from the other two is manufacturing excellence. When you want to compete at the low end, you really have to be really efficient with manufacturing. You know, like if you're selling 50,000 yen pens, you could, you know, have less than stellar, um, less than stellar, uh, Mm. you know, manufacturing because then you can make it up on the margins. But if you're selling a pen for like a couple hundred yen, then you really need every single one to be perfect every time. Otherwise, you just lose too much. Mm. I think now, I mean, I think we mentioned that before, but uh, plus, if I remember correctly, they have you know, manufacturing in, in, in China. Uh, I'm sure they have an ability to manufacture at a lower cost, they have better ability now than they had before. And I also think that we're probably going to see similar price increases from the other manufacturers. In fact, just a few days ago, Pilot announced, not for pens, but for toys, as I think many people outside Japan don't know that, but one part of Pilot's business is actually toys. So they, uh, they manufacture all kinds of toys and they announced a roughly 15% price increase across the board for all of their toys, which is kind of in line with sales price increases here. So given that and given that Usagia price increase, uh, I think we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop here. I think we're going to see a similar price increase across the board from Pilot, depends. But the good thing about this price increase, they're not just like, you know, increasing the price, they're actually going to come out with a new um, kind of cap band. And one of the complaints about the older, or or not the older, but the current um, Special Nibs bespoke line is that this cap band is just really ugly. It's like this enamel mm. thing with sailor special nib across of it. And it, it was just not very elegant, but they're actually going to come out with a new design, which to me actually looks very, very nice. And, you know, does justify a little price bump in that as well. That uh, reminds me of one of Platinum's price increases, like was it two, three years ago, when the base... 3776 model went from I think 10,000 retail to like 13,000. When they announced that, they, they justified it uh, part, partially by saying that we're going to change the cap band on the 3776 to a n- yeah. n- nicer design. So maybe they're using the same excuse here. <laughs> but in this case, yeah. it's a much bigger price increase. I, I, don't, I don't think that like um, the cost to do the cap band is less but it's nice that at least you're not just getting the same old Mm. right like at least you're getting something Mm. new all right um very quickly then we have somehow like a dip pen resurgence we've been talking about glass pens for quite a while now but a lot of big players are actually coming out with dip pens and sailor in particular are coming out with two new more specialty nibs Mm. well so when you think about dip pens i mean I think up until fairly recently, I mean, not thinking about, you know, all the way back when you had quills and so on. I mean, in the recent past, dip pens, I think, has been mostly about calligraphy and to some extent, like drawing. So if you go to art supply stores, you have a lot of uh, like dip pens and, and inks for like manga artists, right? So that and like calligraphy, I believe, was sort of one of the, the people who used uh, dip pens. Now, as we have discussed many times, we have this whole ink trend, uh, ongoing ink swamp, ink numa, and uh, of course, you know, changing inks in a fountain pen with a feed, cleaning it out is troublesome. You can buy. I mean, if you are able to buy a fancy glass pen, then that might be nice. But even if you can can afford, and and even if you can buy like a Hase glass pen, those are very fragile, and I think. Not everyone wants to use a glass pen. I think a dip pen, if you, if you can make it hold and just en- enough ink, I think that would be an appealing alternative. You just want to play with ink. That's what's interesting about Sailor release, um, and we'll contrast it with the others too. But Sailor has this reservoir um, underneath their their nib. Mm. I mean, at least that's an option. 
And what a lot of, I guess, calligraphers, um, you know, they, they use depends. What one of the the things that is challenging is actually controlling the ink because the ink might blot into the paper without the feed. There's nothing to regulate it. But I would imagine that's the kind of ink you use for calligraphy and drawing also has much higher viscosity. Viscosity, right? So if you that's mm. true. That's true, but but you still definitely have this huge problem of the first stroke has too much ink, mm. and then everything else is a lot drier, mm. right? Like even when you dip pens with like fountain mm. pens. So I, I think this reservoir thing is quite interesting, and this two millimeter, this is going to be pretty cool. I think this will be a good tool, like an actual calligraphic calligraphic tool. Mm. I'm more interested in the other one, the the, the fude nib. It look, looks pretty nice. It looks like a, like what we call like a mini mini fude. It's more less yeah. less like a fude demand and more like so like a pen BBS or D like mini fude. Yeah. Um, but these two are definitely like more specialized than what they came out last time. Mm. And uh, and yeah, these are cool. I I have to say I like these better than um, the pilot ones. Because you know these seem to be more functional, but I think the bodies are also much less attractive. Yeah, I mean I haven't seen the pilot ones in person yet. I think they're going to be available on the twentieth or something like that, twentieth or thirtieth this month. But just from the photos, the pilot ones basically look like a, a like a touch cover nib holder with a kakuno nib. Right. It, it doesn't look like they have yep. intentionally designed something that's meant to work together. It looks like they're just taking, taking existing parts and put them together, while the Sailor one looks like a, a custom designed dip pen for, or, yeah, for like, ink lovers. Yeah, so I, I think there's definitely like a difference in thought mm. when it comes to the, the design. Um, I, I wish Pilot almost took that kind of fountain pen route and gave it a a feed um but we'll see we'll see do you want the feeder because the moment you put a feed on it it's going to be more troublesome to clean well if you look at the ones from sailor it looks like you can remove it very easily mm. and because it's not like a fountain pen and these are i guess meant to be semi disposable too i mean they're mm. still stainless but you know you can you can remove them uh, one of the things that it says on the sailor, the last page of this Instagram post, is that um, they've simplified the feed and and the part, and it's actually easier to clean. Yeah, but then you still need to put, take it apart. I mean, what what is attractive about a glass nib is that it does hold a fair amount of ink because of you know the the grooves. Yet it is so easy to clean. You just dip it in water, and you and then then you're ready to ink it up. Or, dip it in another ink but I, I would say that you can use these pens for um let's say non fountain pen safe inks like india ink mm. or pick, like um you know sumi ink and um and that's what i would use it for so i think um i think yeah it's uh i actually would like the feet because otherwise the control of the ink is is quite hard unless you're you know really an expert at what you're doing yeah, it would be interesting to see. I think I'm going to buy the, the Fudu one as well as the Pilot one and, and do a comparison. Yeah, we'll look forward to your post. <laughs> and then there was another one. Did we talk about Kakimori's? So, um, Kakimor has two pieces of news. First, they're also, you know, obviously they're one of the first to have this dip pen um, craze. But uh, they they're they're now creating these uh, pen rests and pen holders that are urushi um, coated. And that's kind of interesting because Kakimori's not really been on the higher end of the price spectrum mm. traditionally. Um, so that that will be very interesting to see how they roll that out. But the second piece of news, which I think is a little bit more interesting, is that Kakimori had some nib issues which they issued an apology for uh, i think almost right after our last uh, our last podcast episode so five days after the release they said um, they released a um, an apology saying that this pen nib which is basically like a steel nib that you put into mm. 
like a holder, right? Um, some of them uh, have an issue with uh, hard starts. So, or like, you know, it, it's difficult that for the ink to, to flow. And they're claiming that it's because I think of some like material defect. And they, they basically are saying that, hey, we'll, we'll do a product recall. Mm. So, but what what is so interesting about this is, I mean, we yes. thought we thought, or at least I thought it was just some like standard, you know, pilot steel nib or some German nib or whatever. But it turns out that these steel nibs are made by I can't remember the, the company name on top of my head now, but it's like a, a Japanese company that's been around since the Taisho era and makes like fountain pen nibs and parts for other companies yeah. including platinum and uh, i mean we have talked so much about well, we, as far as we know there's no like oem nib manufacturing in japan but it turns out it turns out we were wrong that there's a company that does that yeah kabushiki gaisa mm. nihon manekitsu seisakusho mm. um i i like the look of this nib itself and, and and yeah, as you said, the the OEM existence is very interesting. I might actually contact them to see if they are able to do gold mm. nibs. But but yeah, this was a very you know Japanese um, response to to the issue. Um, I just wonder why that issue existed, and um, you know just knowing about the inks. I think what's more important is the slit more than the material. So I, I'm very curious, like why they issued it like that. Maybe just a photo, but it looked like it has some kind of like almost like matte brush look to it. Pretty yeah, cool, it's like sandblasted. Yeah, yeah, it does look pretty cool, and and I think this would look pretty cool in the pen. They even have this Kakimori logo um, stamped on the bottom, but unfortunately, you can't see it when it's actually in a pen. But I wonder if this is something that is custom designed for them because to me this looks this looks very much like a standard fountain pen nib and it's kind of expensive yeah. for a steel nib so I wonder if this if it's meant to have some property that you know a standard I don't know like German nib doesn't have but yeah I think uh I, I would I doubt that that's the case and it, it is quite expensive for a steel nib but um but you know there's also the branding and the story behind it so but yeah just going back to this OMM manufacturer uh, quickly there isn't too much information on the website but the, the landing page has a photo of a platinum anniversary pen with a gold nib which makes me wonder if they are or at least have been making nibs and other parts for platinum. Yeah. Um I'm hoping to get some more insight on this. Yeah, we need to research this this company more and and I, well there is this uh, Wagner event in less than 2 weeks and maybe a good time to ask people about this company. Yep. Definitely want to know more. Yep. Um Two more things uh, very quickly. The first one is uh, Toyoka Craft. Um, they recently have uh, have uploaded a post saying, um, and this is the description. It says, please take care for this web. We don't trade with this company and anyone cannot buy our products from Kingdom Note now. Yeah, and then they list a number of companies. I and and then you asked them about Kingdom Note, but the the, the topic of this post or the or the screenshot isn't Kingdom Note, but it's some like the leather bear, which seems to be some kind of scam shop, right? And then they listed and then they listed the the authorized retailers, and then I think you noticed that Kingdom Note is not in that list, so you asked them about that. Yeah, so so I was curious because you know, I I didn't really understand what this description 
meant? Did it mean because the the photo says that this is the Toyoka Craft Kingdom Note collab box, but then they're saying you know cannot buy from Kingdom Note and it's not in this list. So I was curious, you know, what does that mean? So I asked them, does it mean that Kingdom Note and Maruzen, because they're both not on the list of partner shops, uh, does it mean that um, they're not going to be official retailers anymore? Yeah, you're right that the description mentions Kingdom Note, right? But the screenshot yeah. is not Kingdom Note. The screenshot is not Kingdom Note, um, but it is uh the the product in the screenshot mm. is a kingdom note uh, mm. exclusive or was so everything about this was was confusing yeah so i asked them you know um our kingdom note and mars are no longer partner shops and they said we've ended uh our sales at kingdom note and uh as for mars and we'll continue with uh with a different like sub brand name um, but we'll continue to sell through Maruzen. So that to me is actually pretty surprising because Kingdom Note was uh, was one of the very important. I mean, from a third person's perspective, very important um, partner shop for for Toyota Craft. It used to be that you couldn't order directly from Toyota mm. Craft. You have to you know navigate their very difficult system um, on their on their website, or you buy it at kingdom note mm. yeah th- th- so, that's that's where i bought yeah. i think i have like four or five different uh token trades in total and i all bought them all from from a, a kingdom notes uh occasionally there were there were some uh some discounts i don't think that that's that's the reason for this uh, my my guess would be there's some thing going on behind the scenes here maybe they think that kingdom note is you know Trying to s- trying to sell the Toyoka trace by other means than what was agreed on. Maybe Kino Note is somehow involved in this, or at least they think they're involved. That, that would be my guess. That that might that might be a possibility, but even you know this this leather bear company that's trying to sell this box. Uh, I mean, they're selling for eighty seven dollars. That's that's less than like. The, you know, it, it, it's a, an insane price. I don't even know that Kingdom Note could do that even at wholesale prices. Well, Kingdom Note has had some very significant sales during like the the year end. And what about this? What if this? I think it could be at least a possibility. This may not absolutely be the case, but that there's an agreement that Kingdom Note can only sell Toyota Trace to domestic customers. So maybe they haven't. Maybe. maybe. So maybe they're trying to sell it overseas or sell excess inventory overseas, and that may, that might be in breach of the contract. Maybe, maybe. But um, you know, if we see Turkcraft Craft one day, uh, might give them an ask. Yeah, but they they usually at tips at least and some other pensions yep. as well. So yeah. Yep. There's there's always the drama in Penland. <laughs> <laughs> always drama in Penland. Um, all right, last topic, which is a little bit of a sad topic, but um, but we mentioned back in February that there was a huge earthquake, and particularly we singled out you know Pentanote as being affected by this earthquake, and now they're actually um, they're running this uh, kind of like a Kickstarter campaign, um, but it's not with Kickstarter the company. Um, it's basically a, a crowdfunding um, campaign to help them rebuild. So I've read through the whole story. I mean, it's very long, so I won't read through everything here. But basically what they're saying is that um, in their previous location, which was more earthquake prone, um, you know, they used to get a lot of traffic. It was like in downtown. It's really good. Um, but um, because of the, the earthquakes, they actually had to move to a separate location actually the building that they were in uh was going to be demolished so they 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 moved to a different location which you know had impacted their traffic impacted foot flow 
and that they're basically really struggling. Um, they're, they're struggling to remain open now. And so they've been around for, I think, what, six, uh, 90, 90, uh, 96 years, mm -hmm. um, something like that. And they're saying, hey, please help us reach our centennial. And so um, they're, they're saying that without, you know, kind of this crowdfunding support, it'd be very difficult for them to, to continue um, doing what they're doing. And then you know, they would basically be forced to close. I think it, it's actually a really good, um, it's, it's a nice like campaign to have. The rewards are actually kind of uh, high on the price. Like for 5,000 yen, you get a bagel and coffee set. And then for, for 10,000 yen, you get three bagels or a bottle of ink. Yeah, but that's, I mean, you, you don't, hopefully you're not doing it for the bagels. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm reading from that, you know, is, is that, you know, they're doing this because they actually need the yeah. money, not that they're trying to sell exactly. stuff. Um, and, and yeah, I think I might, uh, you know, put in some money for, for some bagels. Why not? And they're always, uh, they always were very friendly. And when when they go to the the, the events that they usually recognize us and that they're very chatty very, very friendly um another thing i like yeah. about pentanote is that clearly they and hachimonja they seem to be on very good terms they they seem to be helping each other at the the pen shows sometimes only one of them go to the shows and they bring and uh, the pens and other stuff from the, the other store so yeah very very friendly people so yeah i agree these people should be supported so i'll probably get some bagels too yeah um pentanoto is is definitely one of these shops that i want them to you know remain in business 100 mm. percent. um and they're up in talk too so maybe we'll take a trip up there closer to your usual route exactly exactly <laughs> all right so i think that's uh pretty much all the topics that we uh wanted to cover there was one release that we didn't talk about but we can talk about that next time uh so stay tuned yeah. um otherwise i think that's been a very long and uh information filled episode yeah we always end up one hour whether we have topics for three hours or 30 minutes we seem to calibrate it that's it always becomes one hour. Yeah. You know, this is a uh, podcasting skill. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thanks so much, everybody. This has been episode 59. And uh, yeah, remember to give us a follow, um, you know, help us spread the word. Um, and we'll talk to you next time. Uh, and you can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com on Instagram and TikTok at Tokyo Station Pens and on Twitter at Tokyo Station MNH. And my name is Jacob. I'm Fudofan on Instagram and on Twitter and I have a blog at fudofan.com. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.